Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is John Jake Gaming on the mic here, coming at you with a brand new episode of the Gore Pirates Dynasty here on NCAA 14, but also using that Oklahoma High School football mod as well. We are coming off of an excellent season, a season in which we've won double digit games. We end up finishing 10 and 3. And going into spring ball, we are the number 24 team in the state of Oklahoma. So what this team was able to accomplish here in year number two was nothing short of spectacular. And also in that mode of meeting, not only meeting expectations, but exceeding expectations as well. So with that being said, we now look forward to the future as what you're seeing on the field right now this is the future of your gore pirates team these are your projected starters for next year not worried about the incoming freshman class that is coming in from middle school yet and so far a little bit discouraged grand we are going up against kaden lesnu kaden lesnu one of the better underclassmen quarterbacks in the state of oklahoma he threw for 35 passing touchdowns this season he was a certified dog no x-ray required but with the injury to matt gemitar he is still dealing with his elbow issue not fully clear to throw and take on contact yet we'll also get an additional look at Derek davis as well Derek davis of course one of those players that was a backup quarterback for us yes but came in and played in key spots and we're going to be looking for new players to certainly come in and play in key spots such as rj valencia the two top running backs are graduating next year so is this an rj valencia opportunity as well can he earn some playing time after suffering that devastating injury way back in year number one he did lose his starting running back job since then so that being said we have a lot of that and so much more hopefully you guys enjoy this action that we have going on with our spring game against McAllister, who is a very good football team as well and overall i just hope you enjoy this offseason recap if you're gonna enjoy this stuff man i would truly appreciate it if you went ahead and hit that like button for me that would just warm my heart tremendously um because it would feel a lot better than seeing uh my own defense give up a 30-yard touchdown but also if you're loving this series and you know you're relatively new to the channel as well i would deeply enjoy it on top of that if you just went ahead and hit that subscribe button for me i would truly appreciate that from the very bottom of my heart but let's see how Derek Davis is going to handle this two-minute drill. Less than two minutes left to play in the first half. We have a chance to really work on our two-minute drill for someone that could be expected to get some playing time here in year number three. As Davis is going to take an absolutely massive shot. Glad that he is okay at the very least. But a third and long, which is a spot that we don't necessarily want to be in. But we've well, Beef Wellington, though, is going to make us right. We heard about him a little bit more in year number one than we did in year number two. Kind of took a back seat to the Jackson Durants and the Jody Gentrys of the world. Still a quality football player that I should expect for him to have a bigger role going into year number three as well he's going to be in line to compete for that wide receiver two job next season behind jody gentry but that being said we saw Derek davis get the touchdown but let's see how our defense reacts to the two minute drill of its own and how about this Orleans cobb who has primarily been a backup this year well he has a chance to shine now that some of the seniors such as an easton lynn is going to graduate it opens up playing time for him and he's been playing it in some good spots in in uh, the opportunities that he does get but maybe a bigger role could certainly benefit him moving forward but that being said we're going to take a look at Derek davis a little bit more tries to force that throw over to jody dentry and honestly not a great decision there as he does end up throwing an interception 
and it will could set up a Miss Callister touchdown in order to go ahead and take the lead. And so they do exactly that. EY Chapman is going to score for the McAllister Buffaloes. And suddenly McAllister has this lead. How does our quarterback and Derek Davis respond? This is a big one for him as he's trying to retain at least that backup quarterback job. Davis is going to drop back. Looks over the middle. Wants to get it out to Jody Gentry again. Didn't even look at the tight end streaking downfield. He had him open but just wanted his star receiver just a little bit more. And Kalen Moore is going to have an interception. Not that it was even a bad decision. It truly wasn't a horrific de decision at all. He just led him upfield a little bit too much. That's where the problem truly came from. So, McAllister, they're going to take over yet again. Shroud doing a great job navigating the pressure and still able to find Chaz Bradley, who's going to be able to get a huge touchdown through the air and so McAllister the Buffaloes are gonna open this up a little bit they choose not to go for that two-point conversion though so they're gonna be up 31 to 20 34 to 21 I should say and we're gonna need to score at least on our next couple of possessions and even if we score here we got to make some stops on defense however I love the fight that we have even though we're playing with some backups, at least a notable amount of backups in this game. Of course, uh, we will have a good chunk of our starters coming back, particularly on the offensive line. But definitely some inexperience in the skill guys. But I love how they're reacting right now. And matter of fact, they have a chance to win this game, win the spring scrimmage against McAllister. That could be a big message to send as we go deeper into the offseason. That is a dot to Jake Durant, though. A 29-yard reception. And Jake Durant is going to have himself a first down on that play. So now, second and three coming up here as Davis lines up under center. Davis looking to finish the drive off. Just going to run it in himself. And Derek Davis is going to be able to get in completely untouched. And that is going to be a touchdown for your Gore Pirates. And sure enough, that will be enough to take down McAllister 35-34. to I, While I didn't love all the explosive plays that we gave up defensively, certainly got to work on that as we get deeper into the spring and into the summer when we get our training results. I love the fight that we have in this team. It makes me think that no matter what the circumstances are, no matter who we're coming up against, we're going to be competitive yet again, and I think that'll be a nice step forward for us as we weren't too far off from being in that state championship conversation, at least relative to our rank. I think this is the type of season, the season that we just had was good for us to get some respect, and I like what I saw overall. Guys will uh, shared carries between RJ Valencia and Derek Davis. Valencia might be in line to start for us at tailback. So if he can rekindle his confidence from when he was, what is it, a sophomore, then I think we could have another dynamic running game yet again. But I'm also curious about what some of these other receivers can do. Daniel Tuso, we didn't talk about him too much, but he quietly had a good game as well. Six for 84. Cole Consetti did give up a sack, and he's uh, someone that's fighting off AJ Ajak Clemson for that starting center job. So that's going to be a constant battle. A quality player, too. Now, that being said, we did force a couple of turnovers uh, in this one. You know, Lorenz Cobb and Dalton Veratine were able to get interceptions. We also did a good job getting to this quarterback, Isaac Smith, another person that could step up. And overall, I was pleased with, with the performance. So just checking out some of the NC, uh, not NCAA leaders, but the leaders of the state of Oklahoma. This was a banner year for our defense, a year in which we saw four of our guys be in the top five. Easton Lynn led the state of Oklahoma with 74 solo tackles this year, but you also had Quadir Johnston, Brandon Berry, and Porter Lindstrid all in that top five as well with at least 60 solo tackles to their name. Now, that being said, let's check out the rest of the stats for our guys. And this is a good year for Matt Gimitar. A little bit of surprise that Matt Gimitar got to start because of how Jason Clemens 
was the backup quarterback last year, but to Matt Jimitar's credit, he really played well. Threw for 2,400 yards, 18 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. He also was very good at running on the ground as well. Ran for nearly 450 yards and 10 touchdowns. So 28 total touchdowns to 5 interceptions. We will gladly take that and we should get him back for his senior year as well. Speaking of continuity at the quarterback position, we should have our backup as well, Derek Davis. Derek Davis stepped up in that sectional championship game, really shined in his only start of the season. He'll get the start in, he did start in spring ball as well. 570 yards, five touchdowns, no interceptions. Also flashed some of that mobility, and that's why we went with him as our backup in the first place. He had more mobility than Jason Clements. Now, for our running game, we actually only had one running back that ran for over a thousand yards this year. That was Vita St. Louis. In his senior year, he's going out with a bang, ran for of over a thousand yards, had 11 touchdowns to go with it, too. And Vita St. Louis, while well, he won't get any college attention whatsoever he is someone that was a very good player for us and he also was nice with the hands as well i don't think he only dropped one pass this year that was an improvement from last year and he had a longer reception of 37 yards so you love to see that we of course talked about matt Gimentar's legs but how about carl durant a little bit of an underrated player in this offense he really made the most of his opportunities averaging four and a half yards a carry had four touchdowns too not to mention Derek Davis JC McCoy and the fellow freshman fullback and Mason Smith they all found the end zone as well this was more of a running predicated offense but that doesn't mean our receivers were not able to shine because that was certainly not the case a kind of a breakout year for Jody Gentry. Had over 700 yards receiving after just 420. Nice. Last year, also found the end zone far more often. He had seven receiving touchdowns, which also led your Gore Pirates this year. And what about Jackson Durant as well? Jackson Durant hardly played his junior year because of academic issues. We saw some of the talent that we saw in the spring game last year, and we got to see it here in a full season. Really made the most of his senior campaign as well. Shout out to Jake Durant with over 500 yards and four touchdowns. Casey Siverly, an underrated guy as well. He had two touchdown grabs. Beef Wellington had seemed like a little bit less of a role than last year, but he was always good for a big play down the field at times. He did have a 52-yard reception as his longest. He had three receiving touchdowns this season. Oh, and Vita St. Louis also caught a touchdown too. Now for blocking, blocking actually was pretty good for us this year. We did not take a lot of sacks over the course of the season. Really the only two people that took sacks all year was Picasso Nelson, but he was on our right side and we have right-handed quarterbacks that like to scramble to the right. So I'm going to give Picasso Nelson a pass there. But then the left tackle, Kayshawn Roundtree, he is always a sophomore, so he has time to grow, but would like to see Kayshawn Roundtree gets at least one pancake in a year. You know, it's hard to get pancakes recorded in actual gameplay. It would be different if it's simulation, I would imagine. But Kayshawn Round Thierry did lead the most uh, sacks of anybody uh, on the Gore offensive line this year. Now, finally, defensively, the defense, listen, I think really took a step up this year. It seems like he had more of a distribution in who got to this quarterback. This year, Savian Simmons led the team in sacks this year. He had really a breakout campaign. Did not play much his freshman year, but as a sophomore though, sophomore was a breakout. Being able to get seven sacks and two forced fumbles from that interior, I'm really pleased with what I saw there. And he still has two more years left with us within the Gore program. But not too far behind us though was Thomas Holsky. Thomas Holsky, another sophomore that stepped up for us this year. It was a young defensive line. He did not play his freshman year. He was a reserve player for the Gore Pirates, but this year in his first year of varsity, he made some noise, man. You love to see that. And then the only other player with five sacks as well is Jamie Fletcher, a junior who's also happens to be on that defensive line. 
played very sparingly his sophomore year, but a bigger role in his junior year leads to bigger stats, obviously. Other players to get to his quarterback was Jace Henry, but Chase Henry did have the same year as last year. He honestly did take a step back. He only had three sacks compared to five sacks last year. And then Brandon Barry, the senior linebacker, uh, the defensive captain of this team, was kind of that uh, do-it-all kind of linebacker. Didn't put up the same stats as last year with the emergence of Quidier Johnson, but the dude could certainly play. There's no questions about that either. Speaking of uh, getting to this quarterback, we forced some turnovers this year. Now, we did only have one person have more than one interception this year. That was Porter Lindstrade, who was named to All-State once again. We'll check out that li uh, All-State list a little bit later, but just a good football player, man. Uh, if we're going to have an FBS caliber player, it's going to be Porter Lindstrade. Uh, dude already has 99 awareness. And he can fly all over the field as well. He's a really good football player. Quadir Johnson and Zaire Joseph were also able to get interceptions too. Force fumbles, on the other hand, we had a little bit more of diversity with force and fumbles. Samian Simmons forced multiple fumbles this year, but he was the only person to do that. Dalton Baratine, however, was able to force a fumble. He's more of that hard-hitting type player. He doesn't really excel in uh, coverage. Uh, but he can certainly lay a hit down when he needs to. Jamie Fletcher, Zaire Joseph, and Adrian Waters. Adrian Waters is a player that did not have nearly as much of a role, but was just a good team leader. Just kind of a glue guy in the locker room that you always want. We are going to miss him dearly. That's the truth. Did get most of our fumble recovery, so Thomas Holsky was the only one with more than one. Uh, Adrian Waters, Porter Lindstrid, Chase Henry, and Casey Siverly. Uh, well, they were also able to get uh, fumble recoveries as well. Oh, and we had two defensive touchdowns this year, both of which going to Porter Lindstrid, helping contribute to uh, the scoreboard. So, you'll have to see that. Finally, with kicking, Jake Hills really had... Could not draw it up for any better of a freshman year, right? Steps up, first of all, as a freshman on varsity. You don't see that very often. Starting on varsity, and Jake Hills delivers, man. 18 of 18. His long was only for 43 yards, so he doesn't have the best leg, but when he did get his opportunities, he nailed every single one. Would love to see him go ahead and get a bigger leg for next season. George Kelly, however, did handle the kickoffs, and that's the next step for Jake Hills is, you know, being that guy that also handles the kickoffs for the Gore Pirates. Speaking of punting, though, we honestly didn't punt very much all year long, and George Kelly was okay. He had a 41-yard average this year, nothing to really write about from home. He did down seven punts inside the 20, and he and had just one touchback on the season. His longest punt did end up going for 53 yards. So let's get, take the time now to go ahead and take a look at who ended up winning Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of Oklahoma. And it's going to go to Kyrie Eatman. Kyrie Eatman is a senior running back out of South Lake High School. He nearly helped them beat Carl Albert in the sectional championship game. And Kyrie Eatman was somebody that really exploded onto the scene this year. This is a player that had nearly 2,000 yards rushing on the ground and even chipped in with six receiving touchdowns in his senior campaign so he was very close to making some things happen other players to get mentioned was uh dax noyles out of norman north high school you also got lance debose uh, the senior uh player uh in the state of oklahoma not 100 sure what his school is to be honest with you i i really uh don't have a good answer for you i think this might be broken bow but you guys in the comment section that's more familiar with oklahoma state football let me know chris miller is here as well he's a senior quarterback at ada we actually played him this season and we actually found a way to beat him he is the uh highest rated quarterback in the state of oklahoma when it comes down to that gatorade player of the year uh honors and this was a dual threat quarterback chris miller not only doing what he did through the air he also had nearly 900 yards on the ground plus you have one more quarterback that's on this list as well reed the the junior from uh, carl albert 
who is still trying to lead his Titans team to a potential state court uh, championship. Now, Reed DeQuise is more of a pocket passer, but he has nearly 3,400 yards, 37 touchdowns, plus he has free rushing touchdowns to go with all that on the ground to go with it as well. Meanwhile, for the All-State players, you know, I love looking around and seeing what kind of All-State honors we get for uh, the guys on our roster. So, on the offensive side of the ball, we did not get any luck whatsoever. But, as I continue to scroll through the defensive side of the ball, we do run into Quadir Johnson, who is going to be nominated as a first-team All-State player. Hardly played last year. He ends up with 70 tackles this year, going from a backup to a first-team All-Stater. And then you got Porter Lindstreet as well, the sophomore. He is, for a second time, an All-State player. And, you know, there's some rumors of after next season, could Porter Lindstreet be a guy that could go ahead and uh, reclassify a year early so that he can experience college football earlier. Either way, we're going to enjoy that while it lasts. Let's check out the second team list. Samian Simmons is in here. Samian Simmons, a sophomore defensive tackle, and he's had a very nice season for the Gore Pirates this year. And then as we continue to scroll on down, we do have one more person. It's actually our freshman kicker, Jake Hills. Jake Hills making an instant impact already. Jake Hills ends up being literally automatic. He goes 18 for 18. Granted, one thing that he could work on is having a little bit longer of a leg in terms of leg power, but I like that we have a freshman on the actual All-State list, and then here's a quick look at the freshman All-State list as well, for the, specifically the freshman coming in from middle school, and we only have one in here, and that is going to be Jake Hills, so he ends up being both a second-team All-State nominee and a freshman all-state player at the exact same time a good year for our kicker that is your custom by the way so let's go and see how those state playoffs ended up turning out as we start with the quarterfinals of the state playoffs Carl Albert will remain undefeated as Putnam City West was absolutely no match Carl Albert wins 45 to 17 and they will take on the winner of Norman versus Muskegee, which we'll see pretty soon. And it looks like Norman High is going to be able to take down Muskegee 30 to 25, a very competitive game. Norman would have to play a tad bit better if they want to pull the upset off versus the number one team in the state, but Norman will also advance to the semifinals of the state playoffs. They're going to state. However, it was at this time though that we do get our first upset in the quarterfinals of the state playoffs, Bristol. Bristol was a team that we took on in spring ball to uh, be a little bit of a precursor to year number two. And Bristol was a very good year, man. Seven seed, uh, number eight overall team in the state. They took on Norman North and they pull it off, man. Win convincingly 41 to 20. Really curious to see how these Bristol Pirates do going forward. And so they will be taking on Edwin Memorial, the number three team in the state of Oklahoma, after taking down Quinn and High in a shootout, 35 to 31 ends up being your final score. And so Carl Albert in the semifinals, will they continue their run? Well, they, I told you that Norman had to play better if they want to come out victorious. That did not happen here. Carl Albert wins 49 to 28, and they will take on the winner of Bristol and Edwin Memorial for the state championship game. And it looks like Edwin Memorial will fall short here. They lose to Bristol. Bristol making a little bit of a Cinderella run here. Double overtime is what we needed to settle this, but we got it settled eventually. Bristol is going to the state championship game, and they will actually take on the number one team in all of Oklahoma. And would you end up looking at this the Bristol Pirates end up pulling off a stunner in the state championship game. They take down the number one team in the state of Oklahoma on an interception return. A pick six takes Bristol over the top. The Bristol Pirates are going to be your state champions here in year number two. 
But even though our efforts to make it to a deep run in the state championship at the same time this was an excellent season finishing at 11 and 3 you know if you're recruiting that spring victory so we were actually offered a four-year extension and since this is about the gore pirates and not a coach dynasty we of course accepted that offer so glad to have some stability at least for our head coach and our coaching staff However, one thing that we did realize, though, is that we cannot say the same thing about our coordinators. Both of our coordinators actually did end up leaving for new opportunities. So we'll have a couple of new coordinators once again. Brian Newberry is going to be our new defensive coordinator. He is coming from Virginia uh, Victory Christian High School, and that was a rough year for them. He actually got fired from that defensive coordinator job, so we're trying to maybe rehab and revive his career a little bit. Our offensive coordinator, though, is going to be Tony Elliott. Tony Elliott came from DeSoto High School up and down in Texas. Now, DeSoto High School actually had a disappointing year. His team only scored 20 points a game, so I'm a little concerned about that. But when you are still a little bit towards the bottom of the totem pole in terms of resources, you know, you got to take what you can get. So understand my new my other coordinators that I did have end up leaving for new opportunities. And to be honest, those opportunities were extremely hard to pass up, to be honest with you. Brian Vinson, who was our offensive coordinator for us, well, he's going to be the new offensive coordinator at Matter Day. Matter Day, one of the best programs in the country, certainly a top program, I believe, in the state of California, if I'm not mistaken. So definitely want to schedule them on for maybe next season, possibly, if we can certainly avoid, uh, you know, make that happen because Matter Day is a quality program for sure. And then Zach Spivitol, he's going to get promoted as well. He's going to Quinn in high school. And Quinn High School, you saw, make a pretty good run in the state playoffs. I'm pretty sure they lost in the quarterfinals for the Oklahoma State playoffs. But a quality program in Quinn, Oklahoma. And so Zach Spivitol, he could very well thrive at his next opportunity at Quinn in high, where last year this defense was a top five unit in the entire state. But one of the toughest things that we can always do in an offseason is say goodbye to some of the players that are on our roster that have graduated from high school and are looking to pursue life maybe after football as we didn't have anybody once again that is going to be playing college football next season. That being said though, we are going to say goodbye to some key pieces. Easton Wynn is certainly probably one of the biggest pieces that we had. Easton Wynn was a guy who was a two-year starter for us, was kind of that nickel corner slash backup safety for us, and dude was always in a position to make a play. Now, he did have good hands. He did not have that all-state because he had eight pass deflections this season and didn't turn that into a singer interception, which does suck. I really do not like that at all, but... Dude was flying all over the field. He had nearly 75 tackles this season. And dude was just a ball player, man. A really good ball player that we're certainly going to miss. Same could be said for George Kelly. Now, George Kelly, you didn't see a lot of this year because, frankly, we didn't punt the ball very much at all. We only had 22 punts this year. And... But when he did punt the football, he actually was a, a pretty solid punter. Not a liquid or a gas, but a solid punter. You know, average 41 yards a punt, which for high school, that's pretty good. Not good enough to go to college, but I will say that is actually pretty good. We also say goodbye to a few custom players that were on this team. Jackson Durant being one of them out of uh, the five foot eight fella. He, listen, he was academically ineligible for most of his junior season, but in his senior year, really got it together. He, you know, had a much better junior campaign, nearly 40 catches, 490 yards, five touchdowns, which is good for the fact that we don't throw the ball too terribly often. Oh, and he didn't drop a single pass this year, which is really good as well. Zaire Joseph is another good guy that is going to be dearly missed. Zaire Joseph, a two-year starter on the team. He did end up having four interceptions in his two years up in varsity football. He also managed to chip in with a forced fumble this year. Just a good all-around player, uh, even though he is a 79 overall. He just was one of those guys that 
seem to play higher than his overall. Just always seems to happen sometimes uh, in these NCAA games. Vita St. Louis. Vita St. Louis stepped in after the injury to RJ Valencia. RJ Valencia, of course, getting hurt in the very first game of this series. Vita St. Louis, you know, not a fast player. Probably wouldn't be better if he was to lock on to a college football team. Might be better off as a fullback. But that doesn't mean he can't run this ball either. He ran for 1,000 yards this year. Honestly, should have had 1,000 yards last year as well. He did also have 11 touchdowns to go with it this year. That's not to mention what he did in the receiving game for us. 15 catches, 172 yards, and a touchdown. He was just a good all-around back. Just nothing to really complain about. Was just a pure bruiser. His backup, though, Carl Durant, well, he's going to graduate as well. An underrated player for our team. Didn't get a ton of carries in his two years in varsity, but he was two years varsity, though. And he had five touchdowns over the course of two seasons as well. A good backup running back. So the running back room is going to be a little bit light on experience outside of RJ Valencia. And then you had Didi Mahinzi, who is one of your guys' customs as well. He was a rotational player over the course of two seasons. Uh, the emergence of Thomas Holsky as well as um, Chase Henry made it hard for him to constantly see the field but he was okay when he actually did get opportunities to step on the field he was a two-year letterman after all now if you guys remember eric mccarty from that spring game well that running back he actually does decide to reclassify a couple of months after we've had that little spring scrimmage against mccallister and Eric McCarty, he is going to be at Baylor. Now, he was also considering Miami and Notre Dame, but Baylor was the only school that would let him play or at least have an impact right away. So I'm very curious to see how Eric McCarty's role ends up becoming. He was the number one running back in this recruiting class and was, of course, a five-star prospect, actually the number one overall player even though he classified from the year number three class to this year number two class. So that's uh, so I'm glad we were able to kind of contain Eric McCarty because he is a really good football player. But we now move on to a little bit deeper into this offseason. And it looks like we do end up getting a Christian, uh, a new transfer. This is Ryan Houston. Now, Ryan Houston uh, played at OCS High School uh, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, really did not get a chance to play at all his uh, freshman year. Although, granted, uh, he might have been one of those eighth graders that was practicing with varsity but did not play any varsity football going into his high school days though his family is going to be moving into the gore area so he's going to be joining our team and while he doesn't have any stats obviously he does have good athleticism 92 speed takes him a little bit for him to get going might be one of those guys where we might need to move him over to possibly tailback though you see saw the catching the catching is a little bit of a concern and isn't a very good wild runner, but hey, maybe we could develop that in him or, like I said, move him to running back. I certainly see potential in the return game, however. And it looks like that transfers might be the way to go to acquire talent because I'm going to be honest, uh, the way that we're bringing in uh, like middle schoolers, I don't know what it is if we're not getting a lot of uh, you know varsity caliber talent at the, from the middle school level. I don't know what's going on, but that's just another, you know, disappointing recruiting class just in terms of, you know, the quantity of players that we're going to have to work with next season. We only signed eight guys, apparently, which is insane to me. Uh, how I have recruiting is, you know, I just have the CPU do everything. And unfortunately, the CPU is just a little bit down horrendous right now with, you know, trying to attract talent. So... I do like the quality of players that we have. I think some of these players could step up and play next season. I'm certainly excited for Brandon Turner. Brandon Turner, you know, is going to be a college-level talent, I think, for us someday. You know, just a freak of nature. But, hey, this is a good time for me to talk about how, uh, you know, you guys could be a little bit more involved in the Gore High School series. Um, so, 
these are the players that are available to be picked now if you want to increase your chances of getting a custom player for next season i highly encourage you to check out the channel membership program because my channel members as well as people in my discord well they are going to get first dibs on any people that are available for the gore high school se series so definitely make sure to check that out down in the description below if there is anyone available by the time this video does come out i'll certainly let you know in the comment section as well to let you know exactly what i need but that being said this is what we have working with while i like the quality of talent not a fan of the quantity of talent that's coming in but with that being said, though, the million dollar question is, and Brandon Turner is listed as an athlete, what do we do with Brandon Turner? Well, let's go ahead and look around. He could be a quarterback. That could really be a mean, or we could put him at wide receiver, right? So that's really the million dollar question with where we want to go ahead and put him. Do we put him at quarterback? Do we put him at wide receiver? Looks like he can't really play defense at all. So that's our two options, quarterback or wide receiver. And so what I essentially decided to do was I moved Brandon Turner over to the quarterback position. And the reason why I chose to put him over here at the quarterback position is for the wide receiver position, he would be wide receiver one right away. I don't think it would matter. He would start. But I've noticed that we have a few receivers here already. And it turns out that we know we looks like we will have more than just a few receivers to work with. Um, so we actually might have uh, brought in more people than we thought. But at the quarterback position, we didn't have any middle scores uh, that are going to transition over to varsity football, right? So got him over here at the quarterback position. And he's going to compete with Matt Gimitar for that starting job. Matt Gimitar, he's going to have a battle on his hands we'll see what ends up happening to see how he develops because you know this could create some very uh, uneasy conversations that's for sure another thing that i did want to go ahead and do is make a slight change on the offensive line so darius shemble he's right now behind uh henry stanley uh, as well as Keishon roundtree so what i think i might go ahead and do is i might go ahead and actually go and kick uh henry henry stanley over to right right tackle spot give him a little bit more of an opportunity to uh win a starting job uh granted he'll have some work to do uh catching up to devin anderson who is also a senior uh he might be a little bit more guaranteed to at least see the field partially and then something that i want to do as well is i want to explore the possibility of moving either one of these safeties over to the corner position because we are a little bit short on corners this is what our cornerback room is looking like right now we're gonna lose three of our top four corners next year so i want to take one of these safeties that aren't going to start uh porter Lindstrand is off also uh he's definitely not going to uh go ahead and uh you know uh move from his spot anytime soon uh, but I'm kind of looking over at that free safety position, right? Um, so what I think I might do is I think uh, Chad Fields here is going to be the free safety of the future for us uh, with just in time uh, possibly starting for us. I wonder if we could move Leon Wilson, see if he's capable of playing at that corner position. He moves down minus eight spots, though. So I don't know if I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, he's a minus eight. Um, what about on the other side? Can we do something with Cyrus Harris, possibly? Okay, he's only a minus five, so I think that would be a nice little patchwork uh, for us here. So that will at least uh, carry us to eight corners, and I think I might go and add one more. Okay, so I also what I also decided to do was that I moved just in time over to this corner position. Felt like you know could use some mentors for you know not only lockdowns but also you know possibly Mike Leake or Ryan Hills as well. I do also think Leon Wilson is the free safety of the future for our team. He's a little bit faster, so would like to get a little bit more speed out onto the field. I think that would be a very good thing for us for our defense because we thrive on being as athletic as possible that might help with our shortcomings that we could possibly have in terms of maybe physicality 
All right, so that does take us into the training results. This is the work that's been put in over the spring and in the summertime leading up into fall camp. And we still have a 190 overall. We got Porter Lindstrid. He does move up to a 93 as a junior as well. So if he stays for his senior year, if he doesn't try to like reclassify or anything like that, I think he does have a real shot to really come out and be a fbs caliber football player i think that would be certainly in the cards for him we do have a few more 80 plus overall guys so jake hills is up to an 85 overall jody gentry is up to an 82 dalton baratine had a big off season he got a plus seven boost with the custom training results and then chase henry is also a plus seven as well so i'm really encouraged by what i saw with the overall body of work when it comes to our training results However, it does seem like we're going to have some tough questions at the quarterback position. Who's going to be starting there in the first game of the season? Matt Gimitar, he only gets two of a plus three. So he's a 79 overall, and this noticeably puts him behind Brandon Turner, right? So it's going to put us in a tough position to where do we start the senior or do we go with the freshman? The senior, you know... Senior obviously has more experience with knowing the playbook, and I feel like traditionally in high school, if it was relatively close, the senior would play over the freshman, but you saw that freshman in that 87 speed. That's going to be hard to ignore, so let me know what you guys think about that down in the comments section. We know Derek Davis, he's going to be our third string quarterback for sure, and then we'll also have Jason Clemens and Joshua Plessy who was someone that, you know, worked with varsity as an eighth grader. He's up to a 67 overall. But another question that we had to answer was, what are we going to do with the running back position? It was a two-way battle between RJ Valencia and Mark Sasser, and RJ Valencia wins his job back. He's going to be your starting tailback for season number three, makes it back into the starting lineup. You love that for him. Scott Tanner, who worked with Varsity as an 8th grader, though, he comes into high school as a 3rd string running back, actually sur surpasses Xavier Comstock out on the depth chart. So, Mark Sasser, kind of disappointing considering he was someone that uh, transferred in and still didn't win the job, ultimately. At fullback, we will have a new starting fullback this year as... Honestly, Mason Smith did not really put in the work this offseason, so that was disappointing to see. JC McCoy did. He took that to heart, and so we'll have him play at fullback. He's going to be a starting fullback this year. It's a little bit faster than Mason Smith, so that could add some, uh, some creativity and uh, continuity on offense. At wide receiver, meanwhile, Jody Gentry was going to be the one, and that was pretty well established. But what about the other wide receiver starting positions? Beef Wellington at the two seemed to make a lot of sense, but Delano Tosa uh, could be someone that could be a breakout candidate for season number three. I really liked what he did in the spring game against McAllister, so we'll see if he can take that into the football season. Ashton Griffin uh, is going to be likely wide receiver four, and then Ryan Houston, uh, he didn't get his waiver signed off by his old coach. His old coach refused to sign it, so he won't play for year number four unfortunately he has a year taken away from him at the tight end position though i think we'll have a new starting tight end joe mitchell will win the starting job as jake duran not only failed to put in the work but actually got slower this year and as someone that's only five foot eight you know we had him for the athletic purposes and he's not as athletic as last year he actually might be a third string tight end uh, we might keep him as the backup, but Joe Mitchell, I think we will be starting him at tight end this year. At left tackle, though, I've, uh, we actually had a close battle between Groundtree and Darius Shembo. We are going to stick with Keyshawn Roundtree. He was our starter for us last year, so we'll have the same left tackle as the previous season. Left guard. Left guard, we'll, we'll stick with Kalawe Bazuko. But how about Tamian Ford? A plus seven this offseason. He really did put in the work. I think he'll be a good rotational piece for us in his senior year. Center. Center again was a close battle. Uh, Ajax Classic continues to push Co Cosenti in spring and summer ball. 
but Cole Kinsenny, because they're the same overall, we are going to stick with the senior. Right guard, Luke Young might have won this job at the right guard position. Didn't work as hard as an OJ Mannings, but OJ Mannings as a freshman in high school should be our backup right guard for this upcoming season. And then right tackle, we will have Devin Anderson. Now on the defensive side of the ball, Chase Henry is of course one of our best players that we have on this team and he put in the work this offseason. On the opposite side, though, we'll have Thomas Holsky. I am worried about death here on this part of the defensive line because Stephen McCorvey is the backup, and Stephen McCorvey actually did not study the playbook at all. He loses minus 10 in awareness. That's that uh, training tracker from uh, like the NCAA uh, uh, tool dynasty tool uh, that college football revamp release. So that's how you see, you know, some of these guys with negative overalls. Uh, good work for Thomas Holsky, though. And then a defensive tackle. We'll have the same starting defensive tackles in Savian Simmons and Jamie Fletcher. Same guys as what we had this past season. Now, at linebacker, we don't use our linebackers too terribly much, but we will have a pretty good linebacker group. Nick Burchard is a good linebacker. He'll be a 79 overall. He's going into his senior year as well. Uh, Jamal Moore will be leading in the wings. Gadir Johnson. I'm actually surprised that he was only a plus three, considering just the kind of breakout year that he had, to be honest with you. Uh, Gadir Johnson only being a 79 is a little bit disappointing. I thought I'd be a little bit more motivated to get better, and that just didn't necessarily happen. Um... Who would be the other linebacker, though, uh, could be Brent Danielson, potentially. He's a senior linebacker as well. A lot of experience uh, for our linebackers. Granted, we don't necessarily use our linebackers very much. Uh, he'll likely start right outside linebacker when we are in 4-3 with Duke Crawford behind him. In the secondary, Dalton Baratine is going to lead this group from the corner position. And he put in that work with a plus 7 this offseason. Corner two is going to be with Quinn's Cobbs. We saw Cobb in bits and pieces last year. He did step in when Dawn Baratine ironically did get hurt. So he'll be our quarterback two. Then quarterback three, we'll see a, a dose of Ivor Ashik Smith, who we saw in the spring game. Uh, Austin Price, who is a senior and has experience. And then Cyrus Harris is also another senior that could get some love as well. Wanted to see just in time get a little bit better at corner. Uh, the position change, at least early on, is not providing a lot. Maybe he could go back and forth between corner and free safety. Because at free safety, I thought Leon Wilson, knowing that we're giving him full confidence, would get better. And that just didn't happen. Leon Wilson was only a plus free. So we'll have to explore whether we want to go with Leon Wilson or just in time at that free safety position like we did last year. So one of the things that I do like to do um, when it comes to cutting players is I like to start from the bottom because, because of the surprising number of players that we brought in, we actually did have to make some cuts this year. Now, it's not a lot of cuts. We only had to make four of them, but I am certainly am going to uh, go ahead and get rid of Cedric Britton, who came in from Taylor Mill. I don't know what was going on in Taylor Mill, Kentucky, but he just wasn't that great of a football player. I don't think he's cut enough to be on our varsity team. Then we have a couple of these other players like Kennard Davis, who 48 overall, we just cannot have that here. Uh, Matt Forte, I don't think he'll realistically see the field. Jahan Fala, I would cut, but he is a custom player. And one thing that I do want to be cognizant of is I do not want to cut your custom guys unless I absolutely have to, right? So instead of Jahan Falah being cut here, I am actually going to go with Brian Larson here. Uh, he's going to be the final cut of this team. But yeah, guys, this is going to be your final 70-man varsity roster for your Gore Pirates going into season number three. And this Gore Pirates team came out with the number 22 ranking in the state of Oklahoma after all the uh, post spring practices. I'm interested to see if we get that same love and energy when we get closer to the fall. All right, boys, so we got ourselves to the point where it's time for us to unveil that schedule. And uh, I really wanted to try to find a way to get Matter Day on our schedule, but it's just not gonna happen at least for this year because 
it would have been like us having a home game against Matter Day, but realistically, we would probably have to go to them because the caliber of program they are compared to us at the moment. So this is what our schedule is going to be looking like this year. I'm actually, you know, pretty excited for it overall. Except for this two-week buy. Going two weeks without playing the game, that's going to be a little tough on our guys moving forward. But at the same time, I like the quality of opponents that we're going to have. We're going to go on the road to start the season to take on the Eagles of DeSoto High School. That's down in Texas. That should be a pretty big game. We'll also take on the Clinton squad that made it to the quarterfinals of the state playoffs last year. That's going to be our first home game of the season and max preps really loves this team they're ranked number five in the preseason poll we'll talk more about that in the next episode then we have a road game against vn and this was actually suggested by one of you guys down in the comments section i wanted to get some of those games in uh if i could and it looks like vn was the only school that was in the mod that was listed in that comment but you know we gotta have to we gotta throw that one in there Drum right, it's our rival in the game, so we're keeping the drum right game. And then we get into conference play. We're going to take on Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill being one of the worst teams in the state of Oklahoma, at least in this mod. So it should be a chalk win. New Kirk, which is a decent football team. Piedmont, who is the same way. Cassia Hill Hall, who was bad. And then the last four games feature two ranked opponents. The Lasso Rams, who did beat us last season. Millwood, Zapulpa, and then a rematch of the lower 4A sectional championship game last year. Edmund Santa Fe is gonna be our senior day. Let's get it. I'm excited for this strength of a schedule. And if we can post a similar record than what we did, we should get some more respect and consideration to be part of those state playoffs when it comes to that point uh, when we get to the postseason uh, here in year number three. And it just goes to show at the end of the day that I am so excited for year number three. And I hope you guys have been enjoying this series because it's been fun to really record this and play with this mod. This has been a fun mod to utilize. And, you know, I encourage you guys to definitely check this out if you haven't already. So that being said, if I I'm sure I mentioned it already, but if you want to have a custom player, make sure you check out that pinned comment down below. But more importantly, if you enjoyed this offseason recap, I need you guys to go ahead and do a couple of things for me. Smack that like button and then also hit that subscribe button as well. If you do have to be brand new to the channel and you like the vibes. With that being said, this is John J Gaming on the mic signing off. But hoping you guys are out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.